Uh, so welcome to all of you. Welcome to, I'm Lawrence Kermer. This is part of the uh, annual McGill Summer Program in Social and Cultural Psychiatry. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. This specific course slash workshop is Social and Cultural Neuroscience. This is the first time that we've done this particular topic in this way, so it's kind of an experiment. We hope this, just uh, as a summer program has been an annual event, we hope this will be an annual event and it'll be a kind of meeting place for people sharing interests in this broad area. And I'm going to take about 10 minutes to tell you about this and about the, the idea behind this particular workshop. And then, as I say, we'll take about half an hour or so. There's about 30 people uh, in this workshop for each of you to go around and in about one minute introduce yourself in terms of where you're from and something about your background or your interests. And that will be important for uh, those of us who are presenting to sort of orient ourselves and try to speak to your interests, but also to make each other aware. Because one of the great pleasures of this um, summer program over the years has been uh, the opportunity to meet people from all over the world who share uh, common interests. And it's a very special kind of opportunity because people are self-selected to be you know, right at the intersection of these different topics that we're, we're going to be uh, addressing. So this uh, workshop occurs in the context of the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry at McGill, which is a, a program within the Department of Psychiatry that began in the mid-1950s uh, because many people were coming to train at McGill, particularly from former Commonwealth countries, um, Hong Kong and uh, um, Malaysia and Af East Africa and so on, and they raised issues about the applicability of what they were learning in psychiatry to the context that they were working in. So rather than just perceiving that as an obstacle to sort of to knowledge translation, to sort of bring the, you know, the enlightenment of the West to the rest of the world, it was seen as an opportunity to really have a dialogue and to begin to learn from uh, mental health experiences in different contexts. And so uh, they, the, the people who sort of began this program, Eric Whitcower uh, from psychiatry, Jack Fried from anthropology, um, uh, started a newsletter uh, with people who trained at McGill and gone back home uh, to start sharing experiences. And they did early studies asking people to describe people with depression that you're seeing in different parts of the world and just sort of this um, open-ended kind of exploration, which evolved into other projects like the International Pilot Study and of Depression and Schizophrenia and so on. Um, so the program's continued, but the focus has really shifted in a way because when I took over in 1991 from my immediate predecessor, Ray Prince, he said, oh, you can't do transcultural psychiatry uh, in Montreal. You have to go to some other part of the world. So it was still the, like the legacy, that colonial mentality, that culture's over there. It's, you know, what, we just do things the way things are supposed to be done. And then everybody else has culture, which means they do something in some kind of odd way that we have to make sense of. So that has really changed, I think, pretty fundamentally in our thinking and that, that came out of uh, changes in the nature of, of anthropology itself and other social sciences and then certainly within psychiatry there's much more uh, reflection on this process and so this network of about 45 people around McGill who share different uh, degrees of engagement with these questions uh, has become a kind of hub for activities that are not only addressing global mental health and um, um, uh, um, uh, addressing vulnerable populations like migrants and indigenous peoples, but also looking at the anthropology and philosophy of psychiatry itself with the notion that psychiatry is a cultural construction and it has a history. And the better we understand that, uh, even if we're primarily concerned with issues of knowledge translation and meeting the clinical needs of people in different settings, the more we understand where we're coming from, if we're using the tools of uh, conventional mental health, the more we open up a space for dialogue and the possibility of uh, learning from each other and adaptation. So that's the underlying clinical set of questions. As you know, psychiatry uh, you know, aims to be a medical science in the sense that it's trying to develop a body of knowledge that can be used to address problems. And increasingly, psychiatry, uh, since the 80s, has really embraced the notion that neuroscience is going to give us the answers we need. Uh, and I should say that many of us here are skeptical that neuroscience will ever give us all the answers we need, notwithstanding that neuroscience will give us some of the answers we need. And this course is devoted to exactly addressing the basic science questions behind that in terms of in what ways uh, does social context affect the brain and affect uh, mental health problems. This occurring, as I mentioned, in the context of our summer program in social and cultural psychiatry, which uh, this was, we just, this is the 24th year that we've had this um, uh, summer school. Next year will be the 25th. We're going to have some kind of a gala event. We haven't quite figured that out yet. Probably uh, the overall theme will have the same usual courses that we have. The overall theme will be the poetics, cultural poetics of illness and healing, because that will give us a chance to make something a little more playful than uh, 
uh, we sometimes have. And within that summer school, we have a series of courses in cultural psychiatry and qualitative research methods and um, uh, global mental health and mental health of indigenous peoples and so on and so forth. In fact, next week is a workshop on the mental health of indigenous people, for those of you who may be interested in that uh, topic. And uh, we also have every year an advanced study institute on a particular theme. Uh, and so this year uh, that was on a very timely uh, issue of uh, migrant detention uh, with uh, um, people from UNHCR and Oxford Refugee Studies and people all over the world looking at these huge uh, human rights issues and policy issues that uh, the world is kind of seized by right now and which are in fact only going to get more intense because of global warming and, uh, and so on. Um, uh, some years ago, we started within the summer school. Every, it keeps getting, it, it, the original idea of the summer school was we would have one very intense month. People would come from all over. We could do our teaching, and then we would be done the rest of the year. It was very self-interested and very cool. But it keeps expanding and getting more complicated. So now it's two months. It's, it was all, all of May is the main courses, and then we have workshops in, in June, and now we're having these two workshops in August. And so the idea is kind of falling apart in terms of, you know, my, at least my time management. Uh, so we have to rethink that. In any event, a number of years ago, we started a workshop on critical critical neuroscience led by Suparna Chowdhury. Uh, and that is really the social science of neuroscience. That is, it really focuses on how is knowledge being produced within neuroscience, what are the social consequences of that knowledge, how is it being applied, what assumptions does it make, and so on. Uh, and because Suparna herself is trained originally as a developmental uh, cognitive neuroscientist, for her, this is something that's not set in opposition to neuroscience or kind of one-upping neuroscience, but something that can exist as a kind of self-reflective process and dialogue with neuroscience that can enrich and, and refine what people are actually doing. That's the aspiration. Uh, so that workshop has gone on for several years. This is the first time that we have a workshop that's oriented differently. It's really more at the nitty gritty of putting social science and neuroscience together to formulate and an ask and answer uh, interesting questions about the nature of, of human functioning. So hopefully these two things will go on. They're complementary and they'll continue to go on as separate uh, week-long workshops because um, you know there's lots of material uh, to talk about. So that already took place. This is the the book that uh, Suparna and, and Jan Slavi did some years ago that kind of mapped out this um, uh, you know, orientation, we could call it, of, of critical neuroscience. The other uh, sponsor of this particular workshop is the Global Mental Health Program at McGill, uh, which is one of several global health programs that tries to create opportunities for international collaboration and development of um, uh, research knowledge and uh, training experiences for people uh, in medicine at the medical student and resident and uh, uh, postgraduate level. Uh, and um, this is, as you know, a kind of booming uh, field. It's become the the, uh, the branding of the moment in terms of global uh, global health, global mental health. Our own interest in this area is really to bring precisely the critical social science perspective that I've mentioned to the project of global mental health because global mental health in the mainstream has been framed primarily as translating knowledge that is uh, you know, produced in uh, the north, the global north, uh, to other contexts and settings. Uh, and we're interested in sort of uh, problematizing that. There's one chair up here. There's uh, two chairs up here, and we can move some move a chair maybe back there for somebody else, and we I hope we'll have enough uh, chairs here. So, um, so welcome to all of you. Um, the uh, the program, as I mentioned here, is within the McGill Department of uh, Psychiatry. Although it's a very interdisciplinary program, there are people from. Um, um, anthropology, sociology, philosophy, social work, uh, many, many different faculties. Um, we're very fortunate this year in having some support from a private foundation uh, in, based in Los Angeles, the Foundation for Psychocultural Research. And Dr. Connie Cummings, who's sitting in the corner there, is uh, the project uh, uh, director for uh, this and, and other activities of the foundation. Uh, the foundation was uh, founded by an anthropologist, uh, Dr. Robert Lemelson, uh, who has uh, a passionate interest in uh, trying to bring ethnography together with psychology, developmental psychology, uh, social and cultural psychology, and anthropology, uh, and, and neuroscience, I should say, to put all those together in some way. And so for a number of years, he's had uh, a sponsored, um, uh, through his philanthropy, training uh, opportunities for people to um, become kind of interdisciplinary area in some ways, and that's been a successful process as this thing has gone on for over 15 years or so. The field has kind of grown up. We have journals, and we have, you know, you'll hear about lots of different activities at these intersections between uh, social psychology and so, uh, anthropology and, and neuroscience. Uh, and the uh, 
Foundation is sponsoring this workshop, uh, so we were able to bring in a lot of guest faculty that we'll be introducing as we go along, uh, and also hopefully uh, we'll be uh, moving towards supporting a kind of network of uh, different centers, including our program at McGill and some others, uh, again, that you'll hear about, that we'll be able to create uh, collaborative uh, projects and, and training opportunities for students. So it's another way we hope that this activity will not just be a one-off here at McGill, but we be part of uh, a larger network of activities that will be synergistic in some ways because it seems like the time is ripe. The other thing that's happened at McGill that makes this particularly timely is um, um, uh, two years ago, uh, McGill received a very large grant uh, from something called the Canada First Research Excellence Foundation or Fund, which uh, aims to uh, provide um, uh, support for a very uh, uh, a big neuroscience research program centered around neuroinformatics, and this is called Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives, and it has a social science component. And I chair the social science component, so this activity is another opportunity again to kind of feed into. Uh, healthy Brains for Healthy Lives and to draw from some of those resources. Uh, and social science is important for that program because of its uh, uh, huge ambitions in terms of uh, over a seven year period generating new knowledge in neuroscience that will have impact on how we practice clinically, on public health issues, and indeed on wider social policy issues. So you can imagine how both the critical neuroscience workshop that I mentioned and some of the many things we'll be talking about in this week are very relevant to these concerns of Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives. Um, so let me just say a couple of conceptual words. Uh, you're going to be hearing from vi people from many different disciplines and backgrounds, many different orientations. Most of the invited faculty are not part of our particular program here. They don't necessarily think about these things the way that we do. So I hope that you're going to get, in fact, a, a very rich um, a pluralistic kind of view of the, of the field and different points of view. Uh, what I will suggest is the common element in, among all the people that you'll be hearing from is an interest in interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, multi disciplinarity, putting together different perspectives and the methodological tools and the conceptual frameworks of different perspectives to grapple with uh, big questions about the nature of human functioning uh, in, in health and in illness. So that's, uh, broadly speaking, the common element. Of course, the challenge is to go from the lofty goal of this interdisciplinarity to the pragmatics of how you can actually do that in a meaningful way that doesn't just water down uh, what's going on. And for, uh, the general dilemma we have, and we have certainly have in the context of this HBHL program, is the neuroscience is methodologically extremely sophisticated. There have been dramatic advances at the level of methodology, and it's, it's not hard to generate reams of data. Uh, uh, social science, um, depending on which area of social science it is, uh, has uh, methodology has been much more uh, shaky in some areas or not equally developed, or certainly when it does exist in a very refined way, it's not been brought to bear on the same questions. So the challenge is can we bring comparable levels of sophistication in our theoretical thinking and our methodological tools to how we frame uh, questions. And that's the long-term aspiration. If we think of having this kind of a workshop for several years, we're hoping that that's what we're doing. We're sort of upskilling all of us, both in terms of our theoretical frameworks and the tools we have available to create uh, a different level of opportunity for collaboration. And this is just a slide um, making the point that the reason we have social neuroscience and cultural neuroscience is because the human brain is fundamentally the organ of sociality and the organ of culture. That's what it's there for. Uh, and that's true on many different levels. It's true phylogenetically in the sense that we've evolved to be fun social cultural beings. And so um, that's what's distinctive about the configuration of our brain. It's there on a co-evolutionary level. And you'll be hearing some dramatic examples of that from uh, Shinobu Kitayama this afternoon in terms of how we live in humanly designed niches uh, and we adapt to those niches rather than to some kind of abstract uh, generic environment. Uh, and so our brains increasingly reflect exactly the kinds of social worlds that we have constructed for ourselves. And we were talking last night about the effects of social media, something that Samuel Vesier uh, is studying in terms of um, uh, what the next phase of our uh, evolution will look like given that we're glued to our phones all the time and, and so on. Um, and, but there are these other time scales that are very important to those of us who are uh, psychologically oriented to clinicians who are working with people and in the throes of uh, the, their everyday lives, dealing with their biographical trajectories, dealing with their efforts to adapt to particular social contexts. So you can think of all these as representing different time scales. Uh, over which the brain uh, and uh, body are adapting and configuring themselves to particular 
social contexts. And the word culture has meaning at each of these levels, in a sense, uh, each of these time scales, and maybe, maybe requires different tools and different measures to, to capture some of those things. It would lead to very different hypotheses about how we are either um, shaped to come at an environment already in a particular way, or are adapting and developing new skills and adapting in a very fluid and plastic way, improvising, as it were, uh, to new environments. Um, the big implication, and what I'm constantly personally feeling like I have to keep selling to my uh, colleagues who are working with a very well-defined paradigm that they can confine within the laboratory walls, uh, is that the human mind, uh, insofar as we want to use that, uh, that, that abstraction about uh, cognitive processes, uh, traverses, is not confined within uh, the skull, but traverses loops between each other and between the social world. And again, I think that'll be a common element in many of the presentations you'll hear, that thinking that way uh, is enlightening in terms of uh, getting a clear sense of, of what we're talking about. And certainly from the point of view of psychiatry, where we're dealing with people in their everyday lives, in their different social milieus, that's precisely the kind of theory that we need. It's not sufficient to have a theory of, oh, there's too much or too little activity at this, in this region of the brain. That, that kind of decontextualized thinking leads, I think, to a lot of problems that um, mostly that we're hiding from at the moment, but that are you know, going to uh, make things uh, very difficult uh, as time goes on if we don't come to terms with that uh, better. Okay, so uh, I, I won't belabor this, just to say that you can think of the links between social science and neuroscience at two levels. Social science in neuroscience that is bringing things together to address these basic questions. And I've already mentioned the critical neuroscience perspective, which is kind of social science of neuroscience, standing back and saying what's going on here and why are people framing questions certain ways and so on. And we think, uh, even though this is not the social, critical neuroscience or social science of neuroscience course, you're going to see a lot of that kind of reflection going on and how that enlarges our discussion of particular uh, paradigms. Um, there's a lot of discussion in uh, public health and global uh, health uh, around the notion of, uh, notion of social determinants of health because it's not hard to show that some of the most powerful determinants of health uh, reside in the social world. It has to do with our nature, again, as social beings. And what's interesting is every one of these factors, which are sometimes treated as structural and economic and you know, sort of the brute facts of human existence, poverty, racism, and so on, every one of these has a cultural dimension in the sense that it depends on how people uh, interpret and perceive their world and how they act in that world. Uh, so something like race and uh, uh, caste and so on, these things are cultural constructions in the sense that it takes a certain set of social practices, a certain uh, set of interpretive frames to put that in, into motion and to lead to the kinds of very serious social structural consequences that uh, uh, ensue that have dramatic effects on, on people's health. Um, Okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, the, the other sort of institutional context I, I should mention briefly is within our Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry, we have now a program in, uh, called Culture, Mind, and Brain uh, that uh, Samuel Vessier and Suparna Chaudhuri, who's not here today, and myself sort of co-direct. And we see this as a platform that will bring together the people from neuroscience, from other disciplines, uh, hopefully with some support from the uh, Foundation for Psychocultural Research and support from Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives to create a kind of fertile uh, exchange. And so we see this, this workshop, again, as an activity within that framework. We've been having uh, an ongoing kind of seminar series. I think Michael Lifshitz is here, who got his, uh, one of his seminars uh, up there as an example, uh, and uh, Fernando uh, Vidal. Um, and we have a variety of ongoing pro or emerging projects in this area. I'll just show them briefly. You'll have opportunity to talk to people about these if they interest you uh, as we go along. I'm almost finished. And this, this uh, program also exists with collaborations uh, uh, at various stages of development, mo many of them potential, but anyway, uh, collaborations with many different institutions. And again, that's a kind of network that we're building. So uh, structurally, what, this is kind of what the week uh, will look like. Um, there's a couple of changes I'll, I'll describe in a moment. Uh, and the idea really is for a series of presentations and hopefully dialogue with all of you here to explore some facets of these broad range of topics. This is a graduate level uh, workshop or seminar, so we're aiming for a high level of discussion. That's a challenge because um, uh, time is short and because you are a very diverse group. Uh, some people, uh, everybody has a different 
uh, level of sophistication in different areas. Some of you are experts in several areas and neophytes in others, but they don't all align. Uh, so probably there are going to be moments when people say things that they assume are clear that are opaque. And I would encourage you to please ask for clarification, because there are probably other people in the room who are also uh, you know, not following at that moment. But we, I've asked the speakers really all to aim at very high level because we think the main function of this is not a, a of course not a prerequisite for anything. It's really to stimulate all of you to give you a sense of what's going on and where to look to find uh, out more.